My name is Krista Ross. I'm CEO here at the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, and we're delighted to have you for um, what is going to be an exceptional webinar this morning. Uh, it's the first of a two-part webinar today and Friday. Today's uh, topic is workplace risk mitigation, so it will be on risk and screening and those sorts of things. Um, We've been doing two to three webinars weekly um, since about to the end of March. And I would say that these uh, two webinars are two of the, the best that um, we have been able to get on our agenda. And so we're delighted to be able to offer them. Um, just a couple of items of protocol. We will ask that you keep your mics muted. We'd love to have your videos on if you're so inclined. Um, we'll ask you to put questions in the chat, which we will um, come to at the end of the presentation. Um, and if we run out of questions in the chat before we run out of time, we'll take live questions and we'll ask you to uh, raise your hand um, if you have a question to ask. Um, I want to tell you that um, our speakers today are, are not only um, volunteering their time, uh, which is uh, tremendous and, and uh, greatly appreciated. But they're also each making contributions um, to the food bank where they are located um, just as a way of, of saying thank you to you for participating and to the chamber for hosting the event for them uh, and with them. And um, they would ask that if your company is able uh, to make a contribution to the local food bank where you're at, that you do so as well. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have today with us Dr. Matthew Bernstein, an occupational health consultant and family physician, formerly uh, was in Halifax, now practicing in Toronto. Um, he's had a 30 plus year career and he was formerly the chief medical officer for Bell Alliant and the divisional occupational health medical consultant for Canada Post. Um, he has a lot of experience in pandemic planning. He formerly uh, worked uh, during the time of SARS, H1N1, and now COVID-19. Um, and since uh, this all began, uh, and in early March, a significant portion of his practice has been providing advice to clients throughout Canada uh, as to the risks COVID-19 poses in the workplace and strategies to mitigate those risks. So we are so very fortunate to have Dr. Bernstein with us today. Um, David Clark is uh, no stranger to most of the people here in Fredericton. Um, he's practiced law here for 38 years um, and he has a national practice, mostly focusing on labor and employment, uh, occupational health and safety law. He works with a lot of uh, uh, construction projects in the hydro and mining sectors uh, located in Northern Canada. And uh, like Dr. Bernstein, since early March 2020, he's worked exclusively uh, with multidiscipline COVID-19 risk management teams in developing workplace policies, standards, and procedures to mitigate the risk of employees contracting or transmitting COVID-19. Our third panelist today, Glenn O'Neill, is a Canadian registered safety professional based in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. 25 years of experience in the public sector working for the Government of Canada. Uh, and the private sector in the oil, gas, and renewable energy sectors. He's currently the health, safety, security, and emergency response manager on a component of a large hydro project. Um, and he started uh, working exclusively in the area of pandemic risk, risk management uh, as part of a multidiscipline team back in February of this year. He's developed and implemented workplace policies, standards, and procedures to manage COVID-19. And our fourth panelist today, Brad Proctor, has practiced law for 18 years. He's in Halifax, and he's a partner with McGinnis Cooper. His focus is labor employment and occupational health and safety law. He serves clients throughout Atlantic Canada. And since the beginning of this pandemic, he's worked almost exclusively in providing advice to clients regarding how to minimize occupational health and safety risks associated with COVID-19. So I think we can all agree that this is a tremendous panel. Um, that has come together to present information to us. This, as I said, is the first of a two-part series. And I would also like to give a, a shout out and a big thank you to the Atlantic Provinces Chamber. Glenn Davis, um, their VP policy is on with us today. And we were just thrilled to have uh, the Atlantic Chamber come on board as our co-host today so that uh, people from chambers across Atlantic Canada could participate. 
Uh, the last thing I'll tell you before I turn it over to the speakers is that we are recording today's session. So if there's information that you find helpful and perhaps you miss a detail or you want to refer back to it, you'll be able to access this on our social media channels. Uh, we'll also be providing it to the speakers so they can share it through their social media if they so choose. And um, we are looking forward to hearing from this excellent panel of speakers on today's presentation, Workplace Risk Mit Mitigation. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. And again, thank you so much for agreeing to present to us today. Thank you, Krista. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for uh, participating here today. And just a, a few minutes in background how this presentation came about, myself uh, and um, Glenn and Matthew uh, and Brad have done, worked extremely closely together in supporting uh, operating sites in Nunavut, uh, Labrador and uh, Northern Manitoba. And literally day and night uh, uh, writing policies in real time because COVID has been so fluid. And uh, it's, and, and despite this uh, going on now since uh, mid-March, uh, we're learning more every day. But one Saturday morning, I said to the team, I said, I used to operate a group of small businesses in Frankton and I've always been a member of the cham chamber in uh, an earlier life, a very active member of the chamber. And I said, uh, I can't imagine what it's like to be in small business right now because it is the engine that drives the economy and it's the part of the, uh, the economy that's being hurt the worst as a result of COVID-19. And so we thought, you know, all this work we were doing on these mega projects, this, these deep pocketed uh, uh, mining and construction sites grappling with this, we thought that it would be helpful to try to put something together with small for small business to help them manage through this. And I must say the Fredericton Chamber has been very active with the guidelines that they put out, which are just excellent. And I will say the province of New Brunswick especially has taken a leadership role in Canada with the uh, guidelines that they have put online on March the 8th and their operational plan guidelines. And so a little background on where this came from. And in every meeting that myself and Glenn O'Neill are in, uh, we always open the meeting with a, uh, a safety share uh, so Glenn, if you could provide us a, uh, a brief safety share and a little bit, and one thing, Glenn had one very high, uh, has been involved as a uh, safety professional, both on the regulator, regulator side and in the private sector. And uh, Glenn is probably one of the top, if not the top uh, uh, occupational health and safety investigator in Canada. Uh, his most recent investigation in New Brunswick was the tragedy that happened in uh, in Moncton, where the police RCMP officers were were shot, and uh, Gled was the lead investigator from an occupational health and safety perspective. So, over to you, Glenn, for a safety share. And. As our first panel together, our first IT problem. So, uh, uh, our safe, the safety share that I will uh, I will give for Glenn is during the COVID crisis. One of the most important things is keeping a positive attitude and mental health, uh, especially those that are deeply affected, like people in small business, who are probably the most resilient part of the economy. So that um, my safety moment would be no matter what we're going through, put a positive spin on it, be there to help one another, and we're going to get through this together. And that would be my safety share. And Tanya, if we go on to the next slide. So this uh, presentation is broken into two segments. Today, we're, our focus is going to be understanding the legal obligations uh, as a small business in COVID when you're starting up. Most importantly, understanding the nature of the risks that you have to manage. So uh, Matthew, from a very commonsensical perspective, is going to walk you through what the covert risk and how to manage the covert risk from a medical perspective. And then we're going to close out today's session by talking about uh, the first cornerstone of your operational plan is screening of customers 
and uh, and employees before they come to the workplace. And uh, Tanya will just keep on going there. Uh, so under the Occupational Health and Safety Act of every province in Canada, just motherhood and apple pie, you need to take reasonable precautions for your safety, health and safety of employees. And uh, this includes the obligation to, uh, to uh, manage COVID. Uh, the province of New Brunswick on May the 8th uh, this year uh, opened things up, loosened things up for small business. Uh, in that, we, that's when we went to Cone, Code Orange, which is a uh, layered um, uh, method, loosening of restrictions. And if we could do the next slide there, Tanya. Uh, and in loosening restrictions, uh, the order of May the 8th, uh, it had three cornerstones. Uh, minimal interaction for people with two meters and prevent persons from entering your workplace that have either traveled outside the province or from entering the workplace. The one thing I'll say generally about the guidelines uh, is the province of New Brunswick has put a high level of trust in small businesses. As we go through this for the next two days, we have considerably more latitude than the startup plans we're seeing in the other provinces that, that I'm working in, uh, in that providing parameters to small business and really good parameters and then letting them figure it out. So each business is required to have a operational plan. There's a great template for the operational plan that's on the province's website. That's also, uh, if you have a copy, everyone has a copy of the presentation at the end, it's, it's in the resources. And also uh, the province has provided guidelines and those guidelines are actually incorporated uh, into the order. So you're, uh, operational plan needs to incorporate and be within the parameter of those guidelines that we'll talk more about it. And you must have that plan uh, finished for the, uh, in, in the event you get a visit from a WorkSafe uh, New Brunswick inspector. The way I expect is going to cut everyone a lot of slack and not, not everyone will have to have one, but this is going to be work in progress for small business. So in order to manage this risk in the context of your own business, and every business is different, so the way you manage it will be slightly different, but before you can do that, you need to understand the risk and, uh, and how COVID is uh, contracted and transmitted. So uh, I've worked closely with Matthew on this front in a, in a number of locations across Canada, and I'm going to turn it over to Matthew now. Good day. I'd like to start by thanking the chamber for hosting this webinar. It, it's nice to be back in the Maritimes, if, if only virtually, and if travel restrictions lift, hopefully I'll get home at some point during the summer. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes giving you a, a primer on epidemiology and virology, because unless you understand how the disease is transmitted, where it came from, um, how we can respond to it, we won't be able to develop effective plans to protect our employees, our families, ourselves, and get the economy back up and running. Um, it's hard to believe that it was only six months ago that we were all sort of planning for Christmas and New Year's and making big plans for 2020, when in Wuhan province in China, physicians were starting to notice a cluster of very severe respiratory infections clustered among workers and visitors to a fish market that also sold live animals, including bats and cats and other things that people like to eat, um, and recognized this new pattern of a disease, uh, which got diagnosed or recognized in January 7th, identified as coronavirus disease 2019 and thus shortened to COVID-19 um, and caused by a virus called SARS, uh, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome-COVID-2. Now, coronaviruses have been with us forever. 
There are lots of coronaviruses, 20 to 30 percent of, of upper respiratory infections, head colds are caused by coronaviruses. <clears throat> They're always circulating around and we have a degree of immunity to them. However, in the last 20 years, we've recognized a couple of much more aggressive versions of coronavirus, SARS, which we rec came out in 2005 and was uh, a severe disease in, in Toronto, um, killed about 11% of people who, who had it, and then seemed to basically disappear. And then there's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, which has its host in camels, which unfortunately kills about 35% of people who get it, and it continues to circulate primarily in the Middle East. And now we've got COVID, which um, was first recognized in January, as I said, and started in Wuhan province, rapidly escalated through the population and has spread around the world. And in March, the World Health Organization declared it as a pandemic, um, in, which means that it was occurring in two World Health Organizations at the same time, was a new virus, new infection, and capable of causing serious disease. The global death rate from it is 6.7%. And in Canada right now, the death rate is even higher than that it's 7.3%. And as I think many of you know, it's hitting the elderly and nursing homes particularly hard. <clears throat> so two mo six months later, 5 million people around the world have this infection that we know about at least, and uh, 300,000 have died. So the initial symptoms of COVID, it looked very much like a flu, fever, chills, dry cough, and then would rapidly progress to severe shortness of breath. So that's what it looked like initially. Um, next slide. However, as it evolved, we started to recognize there are all sorts of different versions of this infection. Um, for many people, in fact, half the people who, who contracted COVID, they had no symptoms at all. Children would often look like they had uh, stomach flu with a little diarrhea. Then these really funny symptoms would come out. Uh, disorientation, sudden loss of sense of smell, and, and more recently, something called COVID toe that you see in young people or COVID extremities. It looks like a frostbite-like lesion. Um, and I saw two patients a, a month or two ago, uh, virtually, one with acute loss of sense of smell and one who had this funny rash on their feet, neither of which I recognized as being COVID and said, yeah, probably just a cold, probably just a rash on their feet. Had to call them back a couple of weeks later when we knew more and say, I think you had COVID. And now more recently in children, we're recognizing after the infection has passed some weeks later, they come up with this very unusual Kawasaki disease-like infection with this an inflammation in their body, in, uh, inflammation in their skin, inflammation in their lungs, um, and is unfortunately killing a, a small percentage of, of children who get this disease. Uh, next slide. So who can, who can spread COVID? Well, People with symptoms certainly can. And unfortunately, symptom people with no symptoms can spread it. And you can spread it in the early part of the disease, which actually isn't unusual for viral infections. For instance, chickenpox, you spread it for several days before you get the rash. So this isn't uncommon. The problem is, how do you protect yourself from people who don't have any symptoms? So that's one of the things to keep in mind. My approach, and I think everybody's approach is, everybody has COVID until proven otherwise. And how is it spread? It's spread by large droplets, which can only spread a certain distance, maybe six feet. The world, so the, the standard is you, if you can stay six feet away from people, you will not spread the disease. In fact, if the entire world was to stay six feet away from everyone for a two week period, this disease would disappear because it needs to have a host. Um, and it's transmitted by coughing, sneezing, simply talking to people it's thought or it's theorized that it can be spread as an aerosol as well. Very, very fine particles in the air, very much like measles is spread. Um, there's very little evidence that that's actually happening. So the difference would be if you're on an airplane and you got COVID, the people within around six feet of you are at risk. If you're on an airplane with, and you've got measles, everybody on the plane is at risk. Okay? but we think it's very much a droplet, six feet is what's going on. Now, it can also survive on surfaces, as can many viruses and bacteria. And depending upon the surface, it has a different length of, of lifespan. So 
it's very important that we wash down surfaces, avoid uh, handling the same material, that we don't share pens, we don't hand paper back and forth to people. Though the truth is, it is unclear how much disease is actually spread that way. Because just because you can culture a virus off of a material doesn't mean that it's there in sufficient quantity to cause disease. But we don't know that yet. It's one of the unknowns and why, and why one of the reasons we're continuing to promote uh, keeping separate papers washing down surfaces. Next slide. Okay. Um, so who's, who can get COVID? Well, pretty much anybody can. It's most likely to be caught by people above the age of 30. People under the age of 30 seem to catch it at slightly lower rates, but they're still quite capable of catching it. What's most concerning is who has the most severe disease. Um, and primarily it's people over the age of 65. Over 80% of the deaths in, uh, are in this age group and in Nova Scotia, poor Northwood Manor, uh, of the 55, 56 cases or deaths in Nova Scotia, 50 of them have been in Northwood Manor, where I had lots of patients and made lots of house calls over the years. Um, tight quarters, three or four people to a room, common eating areas, people over the age of 65, people with chronic disease, being visited by lots of staff. So again, people, so who's at risk? People with underlying medical conditions, including high blood pressure which you know, 25 of the population has. Chronic lung disease, heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, immunocompromised cancer. Okay? And then there are vulnerable communities that we have to be aware of. Um, Inuit communities, indigenous populations. This is a slide of a classic pandemic model. This is sort of what happened with the Spanish flu with H1N1, well, H1N1, one big curve, uh, Hong Kong flu. There's typically, a sort of six to eight week first wave, then an interpandemic period of about three to six months, then a second wave, and then six months later, a third wave. So that's why everybody's talking about having a second wave in, uh, in the fall. Whether we're going to have one or not, we don't know, because we've done something, and I'll get you to go on to the next slide, that we didn't do with previous, next slide, we didn't do with previous pandemics. We flattened the curve. Um, the, the red graph is, to, is what one expects to see, but we've really flattened the curve in Canada and we're very much that green graph, that green line, and we're down, coming down into the flattening part of the curve. Certainly in Atlantic Canada, we've been flat for a couple of weeks. Next slide. Next slide. Ah, so where are we in Canada? So, no, back to Canada. Uh, in Canada, we pretty much flattened and we've been going down slowly over the last week. Uh, the last week we've seen cases simply in the 1000 range. And again, more than 50% of those are in Quebec. And in Quebec, they're primarily in Montreal, the north part of Montreal, the east end, and in nursing homes. Uh, next slide, please. In, next slide. Okay, New Brunswick. New Brunswick um, and Newfoundland, so we're moved on to Newfoundland, have very, New Brunswick, uh, very similar curves. Uh, there you are, New Brunswick, thank you. Um, had next to no cases for a couple of weeks. New Brunswick has done a fantastic job of limiting the spread, and the more recent cases have been travelers or contacts of travelers, and even those are, are already a month ago. Next slide. Newfoundland similarly had a very flat curve. Most of the cases in Newfoundland were on the Avalon Peninsula in the Eastern Regional Health Board, and 75% of those cases were related to one super spreader who unfortunately went to a, uh, a wake and spread it amongst uh, a large number of attendees. Since then, it has flattened out across the province. Next slide. Nova Scotia has had a slightly rougher time with it. Uh, again, one third of the cases in Nova Scotia were in Northwood Manor. But again, even Nova Scotia, over the last week to two weeks, the curve has been very flat, less than 10 cases a day. Next slide. Okay. Now, 14 days is important and we, because that's one incubation period. From the time of exposure, <clears throat> 
to the time of developing illness is a maximum of 14 days. Most people get sick within five to seven days and 97% of people by 11 days. But by 14 days, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. So 14 days represents one incubation period. So if you can go 14 days without any new cases, it suggests that the disease is minimally available. There's certainly no significant community transmission. And that's where we are in Atlantic Canada, leaving Nova Scotia side. Um, we're there. Quebec is a, a very different picture. They've just in the last week started to slope downward, but there is still widespread in, in Quebec. So when people talk about planning and opening up, you want to see at least a one incubation period and preferably two incubation periods before you can really judge the numbers. You can't just look at the last two or three days. You really need to look at the last week or two. Next slide. Okay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have no cure for COVID. Hydroxychloroquine is not a cure. It isn't a preventive agent. There are some antivirals on the market, which are showing some success in very severely ill people, but it's marginal. It's barely statistically significant. We have no vaccine. Vaccine trials are starting. There's vaccine trials taking place in, in Halifax with a Chinese vaccine, but it's going to be another six months at minimum, more likely spring, summer 2020, in my opinion, or 2021, before we have a vaccine. It remains highly contagious and it has a significant death rate, <clears throat> particularly in the elderly and vulnerable persons. Um, so we need to continue to be on top of this um, and make sure that we protect ourselves and our workforce and our communities. David, I think I'm back over to you. Yeah, and just Matthew, just a couple of uh, questions before we leave the uh, the the, uh, the medical section. And you spoke earlier of transmission and, and about six feet, but I also noted that on your slide it talked about with the that people just by laughing, talking, and breathing are able to transmit COVID in those sim sim in situations where you're likely going to have people without symptoms. Um, which is critically important to understand, what proximity would you have to be of a person without symptoms who wasn't coughing and sneezing to have a, a, a reasonable, pro, uh, a, a medical, real medical risk of, uh, of contracting COVID? People talk about being face-to-face -face for 15 minutes within that six foot zone, sort of, but really face-to-face -face talking to people for at least 15 minutes or within six feet for two hours. So just walking by on the street or in the hallway is very unlikely to spread. Certainly Odin outside where there's lots of air movement, um, but just walking down past somebody in the hallway, unlikely to spread. Not zero, but close to zero. That's the thinking. So that's why in these, these outbreaks that we're seeing in, in, uh, in meat processing plants, uh, people working in those unusual circumstances of people working side by side, why it's so uh, rampant? Exactly, and in meat processing plants, you're also working across a table from someone. So you're uh, looking directly at them, but you're shoulder to shoulder with somebody for long periods of time. And, and the issue of a second wave, because in our planning, we're going to talk today, you know, about the measures that we're putting in place. But where do you see COVID headed as both as a background, like the common flu, and this, these second waves that we're hearing about and possible third waves? Well, we may have a second wave in the fall, particularly if schools open up and people are clustered to get, uh, uh, together and we're inside because it spreads more easily inside than outside. So that's possible. However, it may be that we don't get a second wave, but we actually get a whole bunch of spikes, little outbreaks in one spot or another, as happened in South Korea recently. Um, South Korea had done a spectacular job and had, you know, for the last two months, they've had sort of 10, 20 cases a day. And, and then for the last few weeks, it had been sort of five or six cases. Then one person went to a nightclub because they didn't shut down. They did other things, um, went to a nightclub and became 
super spreader. And for four or five days in a row, they had cases, 35, 40 cases. But then they've got a very aggressive testing and tracking program in South Korea. And they're not, now back down to less than 10 cases a day. Uh, Singapore as well had um, flattened the curve and then they had an outbreak in an immigrant housing community. About, they've got about 250 to 300,000 foreign workers in Singapore who live in um, foreign worker housing compounds, multiple, very much like nursing homes, multiple people living in one room, sharing bathrooms. And they had an outbreak, um, you know, 1,500 people a day. And they've quelled that. So I'm, and nobody knows, as I always say, I'll know more in six months. But I'm actually expecting more a bunch of spikes rather than the huge wave as we ha as was seen in New York or was seen in, in uh, Newfoundland or, uh, in mid-March where there's that one super spreader. I'm expecting peaks along the way. And last question on the medical front. Uh, when realistically can we expect to see a vaccine in Canada and how that will that impact the business community in their planning for COVID? Uh, well, until the population is widely vaccinated, we're going to continue exactly as we're doing. This is going to be the new normal, six feet away, surgical uh, masks, not, not surgical masks, assuming everybody has COVID, avoiding large, close gatherings. That's going to be the normal until we're widely vaccinated and we have a sense that the vaccine works. And this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. We're going to be at this for at least 12 to 18 months, uh, I think, until we've, we've got a vaccine um, or herd immunity. Um, and then COVID may not disappear. It may become like other coronaviruses. Then it's out there. People who aren't immune or whose immunity have dropped or infants will get COVID and they'll get sick and recover. And then it'll be the circulating hopefully milder head cold version. Thank you, Matthew. And I'm sure uh, at the end, we'll have uh, uh, more, uh, more questions of you. So, the, so under the May 8th order in New Brunswick, and it'll likely be similar if the other provinces open up, uh, there's a regulatory requirement uh, under the emergency uh, order that was issued uh, <laughs> that you're required to have an operational plan and the cornerstones of the operational plan we're going to finish out on talking about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, are you have to prevent persons with COVID symptoms or COVID from entering your workplace. That's customers, that's visitors, that's employees, you have to take reasonable steps to prevent that from happening. And you must prevent persons who have traveled from outside the province uh, in the previous 14 days from entering your workplace. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's becoming increasingly easy, the travel portion. Early on, it wasn't. It was the big source of, uh, of, of COVID coming into the province. Um, but it's I will say on a personal note, this has been a wonderful respite because I'm a person that's used to traveling about 200 days a year for my work. So uh, this new norm has actually some nice features. Uh, so it's mandatory to have what's called passive screening in New Brunswick and uh, quite frankly, anywhere in Atlantic Canada. Uh, the signage must be uh, prominently displayed. This is the screening questionnaire that uh, is on the uh, uh, NB uh, website. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good screening questionnaire, but those are the minimum questions that you need to be uh, presenting. And those are the situations where you are required to uh, self-quarantine. So, what can you do above and beyond the minimum requirement? Uh, a lot of companies I, I see in Fredericton are doing it, have employees direct a person to the signage. You have someone at the door, uh, a greeter, direct people to signage, make sure they've uh, turned their mind to the questions, 
and if not actually ask the questions like we see ha happened in the early days at NB Liquor, a must stop. Um, and uh, a uh, second layer in a, a higher level of due diligence is have your employees sign on a daily basis a questionnaire uh, and have it signed. Uh, and then the third thing we're going to talk about is, uh, is daily temperature checks and where that's appropriate. And then uh, when and when will uh, COVID uh, uh, testing be uh, available in the workplace? So the advantage is, so we've circulated uh, with this uh, presentation and it, they would have just been circulated this morning, resource materials. And in the resource materials, is a sample uh, questionnaire that uh, was actually prepared by, uh, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, Tanya, sorry, that was, uh, uh, that was uh, prepared by uh, uh, Glenn O'Neill, who's having technical problems, who's not able to speak, and with the support of Brad Proctor and myself, uh, Every uh, good safety professional needs a lawyer, and that would make uh, Glenn laugh if he was able to talk right now. Uh, but the advantages of the sign questionnaire is it's an excellent due diligence tool from a health and safety perspective. And it requires the employee each day to turn their mind to do they have symptoms because having a symptomatic person in the workplace, especially a super spreader can have uh, as we've learned, had tremendous uh, bad consequences. And uh, it's a good, uh, and also the, if the employee gets symptoms during the workday, we put a declaration on it that they have to, uh, have to mention that. Uh, immediately, they have to let the supervisor know. And maybe Brad, if you could comment from, uh, once we start uh, collecting personal medical information, obviously it creates some obligations. And maybe from a small business perspective, Brad, if participants choose to use this questionnaire, how would, the, how would that be managed from a confidentiality perspective, Brad? Thank you, David. Um, just to start, you know, David um, mentioned earlier that um, a lot of this stuff flows out of the uh, New Brunswick Public Health Order. And uh, I know by looking at the participants on the call, there's a number of different industries, a number of different businesses represented. Um, but I just ask you to, for a moment, to reflect on your business and to reflect on kind of the safety issues that you experience in your business. So if you're someone that has uh, a legal requirement to use fall arrest or confined space, uh, workplace violence, pre-trip inspections for vehicles, I mean, those are all things that you all take very seriously. You have policies on, you get sign-offs on, you store those sign-offs in a file in case you have an accident. And what we're talking about here with COVID is really no different. We're talking about a very serious health and safety issue, and, and uh, we need to treat it the same way we would treat other hazards and other risks in the workplace. And so I, I can't imagine any self-respecting construction contractor saying, you know, when it comes to the pre-trip inspection for that piece of mobile equipment, or when it comes to operating that swing stage, we're not gonna require you to revisit this questionnaire and sign it each day. So the act of signing something each day um, requires your employees to take it seriously. It minimizes complacency, it, it, and it protects you to show that you're actually enforcing these things in your workplace. As David mentioned, uh, when we talk about employment law, there's always a web of competing interests. So from the one hand, we have health and safety, we may have human rights, and we also have privacy laws. And so we have to keep in mind that we have to ask for the minimal, minimal amount of information from employees as possible to be in compliance with the uh, new legislation. So we normally, prior to COVID, wouldn't be asking for people to sign documents about how they feel each morning, but as a, re as a result of the regulatory regime in place uh, from WorkSafe New Brunswick and from public health, uh, that, in balancing it with people's privacy interests, allows us to collect that information. Nevertheless, it's our recommendation on your, on your screening form, you do have a best practice 
uh, uh, statement at the bottom that does uh, allow an individual to consent and say, yes, I'm providing you this information. Yes, I understand that you're gonna be uh, preserving it uh, and keeping it for my health and safety and that of my coworkers. Thank you, Brad. Now we're moving on, Tanya, to, uh, so as a result of these questionnaires, uh, people, and it's been less common in New Brunswick, thank goodness, and, uh, and more common in Nova Scotia and uh, in Newfoundland, where I do a lot of work, uh, but is return to work after self-isolation. Uh, so from a medical perspective, Matthew, uh, mm -hmm. in, where, how do you see it from a return to work from self-isolation? Uh, it's obviously says 14 days, but what are the, what are the medical parameters? There are two ways to determine whether someone is safe to return to work after having COVID. The ideal way would be to test them again, do a nasopharyngeal swab or an oral swab and say, ah, you no longer have the virus there. Two challenges with that. Uh, one, there's not enough testing available to actually do that. And two, uh, dead viral particles still show up positive on a swab. So people will, uh, up to four or five weeks after people have recovered. So you can be fooled in a percentage of people saying you still have disease when you don't. So there's the approaches, testing, and for healthcare professionals, first responders, Ideally, you want to do that sort of testing because they're going to go back and face vulnerable populations. The other way to do it is symptom-based clearances. If you have been 14 days from your first symptom and you are currently well, symptom-free for 24 hours, no temperature without having taken a Tylenol or Advil, so you have to be off medication, um, then that's also acceptable as a clearance, though a dry cough may persist for several weeks. So dry cough is not one of the things that has to go away. Now, can you get a note or a certificate? Getting sick notes at the best of time is a bit of a challenge. Getting sick notes or a clearance note at this point is even more difficult. Um, and what is the doctor or the public health professional going to do in the absence of testing? They're going to say to the patient or your employee, how are you feeling? And they'll go, I'm feeling fine. Have you been feeling fine for 24 hours? They'll go, yes. And they'll go, you're clear to go back to work. You know, we, the, the public health physician, can, uh, can professionals and the doctors rely on patients for their honesty. So employers, I think, can do that as well. Well, I'm going to then uh, relying on, you know, the, as an employment lawyer, you see a lot of uh, bogus, I won't say bogus, generic medical notes that raise your eyebrows. So Brad, uh, I'm, you've, uh, yeah. you've placed in the package a, uh, a, an actual uh, declaration for employees to sign after self-isolation. Could you walk us through uh, the rationale for that? and? Uh, and your comments around that. And uh, that's a precedent that, that, that Brad had pre prepared, again, uh, with input from Glenn and myself. Sure, David, thank you. Uh, and just to pick up on what Dr. Bernstein noted, it's tough at the best of times to get medical notes, and it's even tougher now. And I am not a doctor, uh, but I can imagine, uh, Dr. Bernstein, a number of your colleagues being uncomfortable having to certify or in some way say, I think this person is, is COVID free. Um, I know from personal experience in Nova Scotia, dealing with a long-term care facility, uh, we had a, 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 an employee that uh, developed COVID and went off work uh, and uh, you know, was, was being followed by public health. And when it came time for them to return, my client, the, the uh, CEO, the, the management team of the public, um, uh, of the uh, long-term care facility, you know, insisted that they have a medical note. And ultimately, uh, public health said, you don't need a medical note. We're satisfied from the science, as Dr. Bernstein has said, that, this, uh, th that they're no longer contagious because we started a countdown clock when symptoms started to subside, and we're satisfied that they can return. 
and uh, and, uh, and and they said the same thing. Dr. Bernstein said there will still be a post-viral cough, but they won't be contagious. So uh, I think it's going to be very very difficult if you insist on medical notes. Um, and so the precedent that we developed in the materials that David just referred to is kind of it's a declaration that the employee fills out. And what it says basically is that it, they, it's a very it's a one page document, and it basically tracks the five questions that David referred to earlier, which are the best practice authorized by WorkSafe New Brunswick questions, and basically says, I went into self-isolation for one of the following reasons. And so the employee would tick the box. Either they had COVID, they returned from travel, uh, they had a symptom, whatever it may be. Uh, then they indicate the date on which they were uh, uh, required to go into self-isolation, and they indicate the date uh, on which they were uh, directed to cease, and they certify that they haven't had further symptoms. And so from a health and safety perspective, because uh, all of you as employers, it's your obligation to ensure a safe workplace, it's our recommendation that having that type of a document completed by an employee would be sufficient for you to meet your health and safety and due diligence obligation to show that you're not allowing someone who's still contagious uh, to return to the workplace. Thank you, Brad. Tanya, we'll just roll on to the next slide. So Matthew, there's been a lot of discussion out there about uh, temperature screening as an effective tool. There was recently CB, uh, Air Canada was chastised uh, for, for doing it. Uh, it's being done in a lot of places. And, uh, uh, and tell us uh, your view. And then after we hear Matthew's view, we're going to find out from Brad where it's mandatory. I, I see temperature testing as one more tool in the toolbox. We all recognize that 50% of people who have COVID won't have a fever, won't have any symptoms. And 50% of people who have other symptoms won't even have a fever. So you're going to miss people, but you're going to catch some people in the same way that your questionnaire is not going to get everybody. It's not going to get your asymptomatic patients. So it's one more bit of, one more layer of protection. Okay. Um, so I think it, it is useful. Um, I think it adds value. I think it's relatively cheap to do. It's relatively non-intrusive. It's instantaneous with, with the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the thermal scanners. You can do large populations quickly going through airports. So what is the most accurate equipment? Well, the most accurate equipment is a rectal thermometer, but we're not doing that. Uh, that, that is a little intrusive and it is time consuming and most managers don't want to do that. <laughs> Good, wonderful. Um, so, the, the, so you want something that's, that's accurate, but it's also easy to do. Next would be an ear thermometer, but that means you have to touch somebody. So a thermal scanner is generally a good one, is generally accurate plus or minus 0.3 degrees. So, and if you pick 38 or greater as your cutoff, you're going to get certainly some of the people, certainly people you'd want to take a look at. Uh, location to take temperature, well, uh, you could do it at the door coming into the workplace, or you can have employees do it at home. Um, who will do the temperature screen? Well, because it's non-invasive, I mean, anyone can do it. I mean, uh, parents do it for their children. You don't have to be a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare professional to take someone's temperature. Um, you do need to have a healthcare professional lay out what the guidelines will be based on certain temperatures. Um, and are temperatures recorded? Um, well, I suppose they could be. You should record greater than or equal to 38 degrees. Anything less than that, I don't need, you need to record, but that may be a legal issue. Uh, I think you just need to say that you tested above 38 or below 30 or 37.9 or below. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, if we could go to the, uh, the next slide and I, and uh, where we talk about, uh, and Brad, I might've missed a few instances of when I create the slide of when it is mandatory to do temperature testing in New Brunswick. So why don't you walk us through when it is an absolute requirement to do temperature testing? Uh, uh. Sure, David. Uh, what I would say is, is um, for, for folks on the, on the phone, um, and I found this a lot with clients across Atlantic Canada, 
uh, we get, we tend to get our news through a lot of sources like either Apple News or CBC or CTV, and uh, you know we're constantly consuming the news, and uh, you know we got to be careful when the news is reporting a requirement, uh, whether that requirement uh, is something that's from our specific provincial jurisdiction. So I just caution you about uh, getting your information from the news. Uh, what I would suggest that you do in New Brunswick is you go to the public health website. You go to WorkSafe New Brunswick website and you print off the very user-friendly, very clear materials that have been prepared by public health and by WorkSafe New Brunswick. And in New Brunswick, uh, the materials are entitled, as many of you may have seen them, Embracing the New Normal as We Safely Return to Work. And there's another document called the COVID-19 Health and Safety Measures for Workplaces. Those documents have effectively become the law, if you will, in New Brunswick, because those documents are linked by reference into the public health orders that have been ordered by Minister Urquhart in New Brunswick. So um, to David's specific question, when is temperature screening become mandatory? Well, if you're a workplace that can ensure that your workers, your customers, all stay two meters apart, then temperature screening is not going to be mandatory. If you're a workplace where uh, you can't ensure uh, two meters of social distancing, then uh, as noted in Embracing the New Normal, uh, a couple of different things are gonna become mandatory. Uh, first and, and foremost is uh, you're gonna have to do active screening. So active screening is where you have to actually designate someone in your workplace to actively screen your personnel, to actively ask them questions. Secondly, you're going to have to look at the installation of, of barriers uh, where people are working uh, closer than, uh, than two meters. And uh, thirdly, if you can't do that, then you're gonna have to actively temperature screen individuals. So once again, ensure that someone in your workplace is tasked with uh, taking people's temperatures through the various, uh, Dr. Bernstein, you referred to them, either disposable thermometer or infrared thermometer. And there's a further requirement if you are a place that can't ensure two meters of social distancing and you have people working on a continuous shift, meaning you have employees working uh, 24 hours around the clock, then you're going to have to ensure that that active screening is done uh, at the start of someone's shift and thereafter every five hours. And so those are the requirements that are uh, in uh, the New Brunswick uh, Embracing a New Normal document, page 11. Like I said, if you haven't printed it off, you should print it off and read it. Um, and, uh, and look at how it would apply in your workplace. If I might say one more thing about temperature screening, the person who does the screening, if they're getting within that six foot window, needs to wear appropriate PPEs. Um, and if they're doing the hand one where they're putting it up to people's ears, they need to change their gloves or make sure they don't touch the person. So a thermal scan from more than six feet away, while it loses a little bit on accuracy, it saves you time and costs and risks to employees in terms of coming in closer contact. So the most common one we see, uh, Matthew, is the one uh, on the forehead, uh, which I think you mentioned, but what's, what form of PPE would the person, what form of training and PPE would that person need? That would be the most common one that you would see for the, for the few small businesses that would have to do temperature screening from a mandatory perspective, uh, how would that occur? Walk me through the PPE and, uh, and how the person be trained. Well, the, the, if, if you're within the two foot or six foot window, you'd need to wear a mask. Um, you're not doing anything that would cause an aerosolization. So you don't really need a shield. Obviously, they should have a glove. Um, and if there's the potential for the glove to touch the, the person, although you shouldn't really get that close, you'd need to change the glove each time. But theoretically, you wouldn't have to. Um, the person needs to be trained on how to use the device, pretty straightforward, and also how to don and doff their mask to make sure they don't uh, uh, touch their face, they wash their hands before they take their mask off and wash their hands again afterwards. Okay. Putting, putting on and taking off of the equipment is where most people, including healthcare professionals, 
pick up infections. It's not actually directly from the patients. We, we tend to self-inoculate. Excellent. And Brad, uh, if you could comment, uh, and again, uh, you've created in the, uh, in the precedent, uh, in the document package, uh, there's a uh, declaration uh, a form to be signed by employees uh, when for uh, consenting to temperature checks and the information for temperature checks. Now, I want to emphasize that that is not a requirement unless you start recording personal information in writing from the temperature checks. But it, maybe you could walk us through why it might be appropriate and what are the advantages and disadvantages, Brad? A lot of, a lot of this, uh, let's, let's be frank, we've got uh, a lot of people that have been either laid off or furloughed or working from home. And I know a lot of the questions that likely a lot of you have and employees have, uh, they're, they're questions relating to fear and uncertainty. So uh, the more transparent you can be as an employer, the more concrete you can be in sharing your plans that you're going to be putting in place, the better. And so if, you are, uh, if an employee comes back to work and it hasn't been communicated to them uh, what you're doing, it hasn't been communicated to them that you're gonna be screening them or temperature uh, checking, then you're gonna encounter that fear, that resistance, that uncertainty, that pushback. Um, when it comes to temperature sc uh, screening, the act of screening, as I mentioned, that is not something that you're doing voluntarily. That is something that if you cannot maintain two meters of distance is required by you. And so in the same way that if you have a delivery vehicle that delivers uh, you know, your goods throughout the city of Fredericton, would you let an employee drive your company delivery vehicle without a driver's license? Uh, no. Uh, would you require your employee provide you a copy of their driver's license so that you have it on file for due diligence? Yes, you would. And if an employee said to you, uh, sorry, boss, I'm going to deliver the goods, but I'm not going to share my driver's license with you. I'm not going to share uh, proof that I actually have a driver's license. Would you let them drive the vehicle? No, you wouldn't. And so we kind of have to look at the temperature checking in the same way. Uh, the, the, the New Brunswick government of WorkSafe New Brunswick is requiring that we do this in workplaces where we can't share uh, we, we can't uh, minimize social distancing, so we have to do this, and so we have to make that clear to employees. Um, so we're, if an employee is not going to sign a document that says that they're willing to cooperate with the temperature checking, and they're willing for us to retain those readings for a period of time, then unfortunately we're not going to be able to let that employee uh, enter the workplace. So there's a best practice of getting their consent, uh, letting them know why, that it's for their safety, the safety of their coworkers, that will be retaining that information uh, because if we have an outbreak, I can guarantee you that public health is gonna come to our workplace and WorkSafe New Brunswick and say, show me the documents, show me the temperature reading, show me the proof that you've been doing this. And so you have to retain these for a period of time. And Brad, what about the worker that is over 38 degrees uh, one day and, uh, and you send him away, him or her away, What's the, uh, how would you, from a, how would you reintegrate that person into the workforce? And maybe that's a better than, a, a ma might be a medical question to Matthew, but uh, I'll take a run at you first, then we'll go to Matthew. <laughs> sure. So that, that, uh, that is one of the indicia. If we look at New Brunswick, WorkSafe New Brunswick approved uh, questionnaire, uh, the first one gets at the symptomatology or the symptoms. And one of the symptoms is having a temperature of over 38 degrees. And so that's someone that we're not going to be, uh, we're not going to permit them to come into the workplace and we're going to direct them uh, to public health. And we're going to need to ensure that they have communicated with public health. And it's highly likely, and I don't want to tread on, uh, on uh, you know, doctor's advice, but if public health gets a phone call from someone uh, and they say, look, I've got a temperature, um, it's probably likely they're going to be tested. And so uh, that we're going to need to ensure uh, that they do that, that they comply with whatever directive they get. And that dovetails back to if they have to self-isolate, well, then they are granted that period of self-isolation. And whatever mechanism you're going to follow, if you choose to follow the self-declaration uh, path, uh, you'll require that before they come back to the workplace. 
Matthew, over to you. Trump the legal, Trump the legal advice, please. <laughs> no, no, I think the, the, the advice to call public health or a family doctor is the right thing to do. Um, and if you're in a province that's lucky enough to have testing readily available, um, and New Brunswick has got the numbers down and Newfoundland and, and Nova Scotia too, where they're able to do that. In Ontario, we're still only testing the very ill. So someone who complains about a fever only isn't going to get tested in Ontario. Um, so what do you do in the absence of testing? Um, you have to have them at least 24 hours without any symptoms. Um, and that includes fever off of medication. So they need to have talked to their physician, but in terms of the screening questionnaire, when they come back, um, if they've had a fever within 24 hours, they can't come in either. And if they took Tylenol on the day you tested them again, that's no good because the Tylenol will hide or mask the fever. So they may need to be off for a couple of days regardless. And in, in, in for small business, that leads to a bigger question because you're going to have people that are required to self-quarantine and they're going to feel that uh, ones that have had uh, one of the symptoms and they're losing their income if they're not on one of the programs and they've returned to work. Is there any scenario that a person can return to work inside those 14 days, Dr. Bernstein, and then to you, Brad? Um, if they've culture negative within the 14 days, they can return to work. Uh, other than that, I don't think they should, although different provinces have slightly different guidelines on that. Um, British Columbia has 10 days. The Centers for Disease Control has suggested seven days from the start, which includes three days without symptoms. Um, but I, I generally like the 14 days. I'm a 14 day guy. And New Brunswick says 14 days. Uh, and, and Brad, from a legal perspective, do you see that, that once, you saw, once you're required to self-isolate, is there any situation that you could come back earlier with a doctor's note, other than a, a, a negative test, as Matthew said? Because a, a lot of employees are going to say to their, I got to come back, I haven't had symptoms, and I need to make money. No, and I think, um, I think David, that I, I'm going to repeat one thing uh, again here, just to be clear. Um, you said it at the start, David, you said that uh, if a WorkSafe New Brunswick person comes into your workplace, this operational plan needs to be in writing and you have to be able to produce it. Um, I also think you should be communicating it to employees because as I've heard uh, folks like Dr. Bernstein and other uh, public health officials say, you know, we're returning to work without this virus being eradicated. So you need to plan that what David has described, the question David has asked, is going to happen. You need to plan for that to happen. And so uh, if you put this in your plan, that if we have someone who displays a symptom, we're gonna direct them to public health. We're gonna then put them on a leave. We're gonna choose a period of 14 days, whatever, uh, you know, we'll give them an ROE if they need that to apply for whatever uh, benefit they may be able to apply for. But you need to put that in writing and communicate that to people. So when it happens to them, it's not out of left field and they know, oh yeah, that's part of my employer's plan. They were clear about that up front. Unfortunately, I've developed these symptoms. Uh, this is something that I'm gonna have to go along with. There's a high degree of uncertainty here in all provinces. I mean, this is something that's new. And so uh, once again, we're not expected to be doctors. We can't, we can't be as, as Dr. Bernstein uh, suggested, uh, you know, uh, saying we're well, gonna be five days for you because you didn't take Tylenol and three days for you because you did take Tylenol, we need to pick something that's supportable based on the recommendations from our province, put that in writing, communicate it to employees, and, uh, and implement it. Thank you, Brad. And uh, we're getting uh, uh, close to the presentation end. So the very, uh, and just briefly, uh, Dr. Bernstein, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to comment on testing. I, I would note that testing is not widely available to employers. I'm working with two employers that are doing testing, uh, one in the high Arctic and uh, one in Northern Manitoba, but it's just not an option right now for <clears throat> small business to the types of testing that are approved to have their own, have access to a lab and the types of personal pr expertise to do the testing and the personal protective equipment. But there are tests in the, in the uh, 
that are in the approval process that are aimed at remote communities and small business. And maybe Matthew, you could talk about where you sure. see testing going and, and when testing becomes available, that's probably going to be uh, a good one hour webinar for us to do. <laughs> okay, well, there, there are two basic types of tests one can do. There's the nasal swab. We have to go all the way to the back and swab and you put, and then you send it off to a lab and they look for viral particles, RNA, uh, uh, nucleic acid, DNA of the virus. Um, and that typically takes the day or more, and if you're in a remote area, it takes even longer. There was a rapid uh, test device developed by Spartan Bioscience out of, out of Ottawa, um, and, and they have this great device, and you swab the nose, and in half an hour, you get a result. Uh, the machine could only do one person at a time, but it gave an immediate result. They had some technical difficulties, and now they're on the back burner, but that was going to be a, a rapid test for diagnosis. Then there are blood tests, um, and there is now one approved in Canada measuring serology or measuring antibody levels. You, you form antibodies in response to infections. You immediately form uh, an antibody called IgM. And then, and that developed by about day six to seven of the infection, and sometimes as soon as day three. And then at about day 10, you develop a, a immunoglobulin G or a neutralizing antibody that's specific for that virus that hopefully lasts forever. And that's the one that gives you lifelong immunity, we think. We're, we're not sure. Um, we, we clearly don't have lifelong immunity to red head colds caused by coronavirus. The med testing done with people who had SARS and MERS uh, showed that the IgG antibody lasted a couple of years, two to three years anyway, maybe longer. Um, so, and there are rapid serologic tests available, not in Canada yet. Uh, Emirates uh, Airways under Dubai is screening people with a blood test before you get on the plane. And if you've got antibodies, then they let you on the plane. Um, going into Austria, one of your options is if you travel into Austria, you can self-isolate for 14 days or you can pay and get a swab done and they give you the results in a couple of hours. And then if you get the swab, you get a certificate of immunity and you can travel around the country freely. Um, and people have talked about a certificate of immunity. Um, Chile in particular is one country that's authorized it. And if you have the certificate of immunity, you can go about your business and uh, without masks and gowns, without fear of, or theoretical fear of contracting COVID or spreading it. Um, we don't know for sure if that's the case. It's the case with all everything else that we get long-term immunity, but it's not complete. And uh, so we're, we're not there yet. Uh, the device that Health Canada approved, uh, the liaison device by an Italian company, only measures for immunoglobulin G. So it tells if you've had it, it doesn't, well, and because it's not measuring for IgM, you, you don't know if you're still in the recovery phase or if you had it three months ago, but it's good for surveillance. And just but at this point in time, for small and large businesses, testing really isn't an option for them. But the advantage is when it's readily available, you're going to be able to tell which one of your employees have had uh, COVID. And it's highly likely if you've had it, which hasn't been totally proven, but it seems to be the common wisdom that for a significant period of time, they are protected from getting it. So from work planning, that will be a very good thing. And then the and then obviously the quick test to see instantly if you have it or not at the present time. And that's basically the advantages. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, we've, uh, we've come to the, uh, the end of our presentation. Before we go to questions, I just wanted to, uh, to, uh, to say that, uh, go back and do my plug for the food bank because uh, um, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that, that, are finding their way to food banks that never thought in their wildest dreams they would be at one. The way that this COVID has, as I say, it has absolutely uh, decimated our economy and the people that small business, the 1000 members of the Fredericton Chamber have probably, not probably been absolutely the, the hardest hit from it. But the encouraging thing about small business 
is uh, in, in, in small business as a way of figuring things out uh, and surviving and, uh, and adapting. And I know that everybody on the call uh, will, and uh, we're open for questions in any way we can help you folks out. We'd, uh, we'd very much like to. Thank you so much, David. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Thank you, Brad. Um, uh, also, thank you, Glenn, although I'm not sure that Glenn was able to actually get in on the conversation today. Um, we really appreciate your presentation today. Um, I will go to the chat. We have a number of questions that have come in throughout the um, presentation. And uh, I'll start with a question from Brian. If an employee refuses to come back to work for official uh, unsafe or fear reasons, what can their employer do? If the employer believes that they have followed all the guidelines and they believe um, that the staff and the customers will be safe, should they call in WorkSafe or Public Health for a, I'm sorry, I've got a call coming in. Uh, should they call in WorkSafe or Public Health um, to do an inspection? Brad, if you could take that one, please. Sure, uh, Brian, I think you asked the question. Um, this is probably in the category of the most commonly asked question uh, amongst employers. And so if uh, Brian obviously is thinking about this question, I'm not sure if he's had it already, but if he doesn't have this question, uh, those of you that, that haven't had it, you're gonna get it. And whether you operate a hair salon, a restaurant, a manufacturing facility, you're gonna have those employees that ask this question just like uh, uh, Brian has been asked. And so there's a couple of things that um, you can do to kind of preempt these types of questions. And that is getting your plan, which needs to be in writing, getting it written up uh, and communicating its effectiveness to employees. Because what I've been experiencing is that the employees that are asking those questions aren't really well informed and they've not received much communication from their employer as to what the employer is going to do to safeguard their health and safety. So by getting your plan written, by communicating, by sharing, um, you're going to preempt this stuff and you're going to give your employees confidence. And that's what this is all about. Your employees getting the confidence that you're doing things uh, to safeguard their health and safety uh, in coming back to work. So that's the first thing I, I, I recommend that you do to preempt these types of questions. Uh, when it comes to this particular employee uh, who's saying they don't want to come back to work or they've got fears, there's a number of what I'll say are permissible reasons that employee may not come back to work. And there's a number of what I'll, I don't want to use the word non-permissible, but not legitimate reasons. And I'll give you just a quick uh, rundown of, of some of those reasons. So the first is that employees have a right to refuse unsafe work under health and safety legislation. So if this employee is filing kind of what we call a formal work refusal, then there's a certain process that you have to go uh, to, to, to follow that. I do note that in Toronto, I read a, um, uh, an article a few weeks ago that there had been a, a massive number of work refusals filed, official formal work refusals to the Department of Labor. And in, I think in, in, they said there was like 250 work refusals filed. And after the Department of Labor inspected, none of them were upheld and the employee was basically ordered to go back to work. So I guess when it comes to managing COVID in the workplace, we can all do it. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that there may be a human rights reason why this person is not coming back. They may be immunocompromised. Uh, they may uh, have some anxiety disorder. Uh, they may be the only caregiver to a special needs spouse or special needs child, in which case family status is engaged. So there could be a reason uh, for, for that reason that they uh, are justified in staying off. In New Brunswick on April 17th, the legislation was amended to allow for emergency COVID leave. And that is where a person doesn't have a support network and they must care for um, a young child who's off because of the daycare being closed or the school being closed. That's another category. But generally speaking, if your employee is just fearful, they're just anxious, uh, they just, uh, they don't want to come back. They'd like to, that's not a reasonable reason to stay off. Or, for example, people are receiving these uh, CERB benefits, the CERB benefit, if the employee says, well, it's, all, it's not really worth my while, I'm almost making as much money getting the CERB, that's also not a justifiable reason. So 
to leave you with this, this question is my, my quick advice to all employers on the phone call is try and preempt this by being transparent with your planning. And when you're communicating with employees about recall, don't do it verbally, do it in writing. Do it either through a letter or do it through email. That way you have a paper trail because if you don't have a paper trail and you're down the road in six months time with an employee saying that you let me go uh, because I had fears and you didn't adequately investigate a safety rationale, if you don't have that in writing, you're likely gonna struggle uh, convincing the labor board or human rights tribunal or whoever it is. Brad, a good but it's not a short answer. <laughs> well, you know what? that is a common, that, that's a not a short answer because that's a, it's I tried to get as much in as possible. That is going to be something that all of you on the phone are going to be challenged with. And so thinking it up in advance of how you're going to handle that, because it's all these different categories. Some are justified, some are. We have about uh, 10 minutes left, so we'll um, zip through the questions that are left. I did want to mention that the Fredericton Chamber has posted our operational plan uh, on our website. So if anyone wants to use that as an example, um, and our, our team was all actively involved in creating the plan together, and it has all the components that are required by um, WorkSafe, public safety, public health, and so on. So we'd be happy to have you use that as an example. Um, next question, is it necessary to have staff, absolutely necessary to have staff sign a daily declaration, or is this an optional extra precaution? I haven't seen the idea before, but could add it to our protocol and operations plan. And I guess in addition to that, there was another question from uh, Suzanne Weiss with regards to those declarations. If you do them, how long are they to be kept by the employer before being destroyed? Brad, I'll give this one uh, back to you. Sure. So, no, it's not necessary to do a, um, a staff declaration. I, I think that uh, what we're providing you, uh, if, if anything, if you leave this, this chat today, are ideas. Ideas that you can accept some, incorporate some into your operational plan, maybe not others. Um, I'll let uh, David uh, chime back in after I say this, but uh, you know, I would say if you're a small business and at the small end where you're you know, five employees or so, 10 employees, who knows, you may not use that approach. Um, we have suggested this approach, and David has suggested this approach in larger workplaces where, uh, you know, you've got a large number of employees and, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have the time necessarily uh, to be monitoring them all. And so um, it, it's, a, it's a good practice. If you are going to do it, I would say make sure that you apply it consistently. Don't have some employees sign it and, and others not. That's where you'll get into kind of uh, allegations that you're not being, uh, being consistent. Um, the second question is how long should I keep the, uh, the declaration? Um, what we have done, when you, when you get a chance to read the material we sent in closer detail, we've kind of for, foreseen that question. And so in the bottom of that particular precedent, there's a little gray box at the bottom. And what we have said is in the disclosure with the employee signing it, we've, we've typed in there, I consent to company XYZ retaining this information while the COVID-19 pandemic persists and to collect further information from third parties should that become necessary in instances that may include confirming the above noted information or should any future contact tracing become necessary. Um, because it may well be that, uh, you know, down the road, uh, WorkSafe New Brunswick comes in and says, hey, uh, company, X, company XYZ, we don't think you're doing a good job. We don't think you're following the law. We don't think you're following our guidelines prove to us that you have been, and that's why having your paper trail and your records intact is, is helpful. Um, and it may well be that, um, you know, a certain employee uh, has already self-isolated once, this is their second time, there could be uh, medical inter interventions. So we've kind of advised the employee that as long as the pandemic persists, we're going to safeguard and keep these records. Uh, one thing I'd like to chime in on is that where I'm going to disagree with one of my panelists, I do think that it is a real serious consideration for small business to give. And what myself and Glenn did, and Glenn created the document, was create an online questionnaire that could be submitted daily. And especially when you have a younger workforce, doing an online questionnaire where it's really checking the exceptions is a 30 second exercise each morning where they have to turn their mind to it, but uh, I'm on all fours with all Brad's other device there. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, David. Um, 
Next question is, what are the financial implications for a worker who might exhaust their sick days due to regular colds and flus that they normally would work through? Well, I'll jump on that one because I think that we want to be good employers, um, but obviously we've got to run a business. And so we, you know, it's not law. Let's begin. You don't have to provide employees with paid sick days. In fact, I would hazard to guess that many of you in small business don't provide employees with paid sick days. Some do, some don't. So first and foremost, if you do give people uh, paid sick days, that's great. That's not a legal requirement. Uh, it's a great uh, it's a great benefit that you provide to people. Um, I have seen all kinds of strategies on this issue. I have seen uh, people um, allowing an advance a drawdown on the next year's sick days. I've seen that. I've uh, seen situations where employers have let uh, employees use personal days or vacation days uh, to allow for this. And then uh, you know what a lot of uh, employers are doing is simply if someone's off on sick is you give them the record of employment uh, filled out, coded for sick. Uh, and as we know right now, uh, there's the CERB benefit where many cases of, of layoff or illness are being driven through the federal uh, Canadian Emergency Response Benefit Plan. We know that that started back in the middle of March. And as it currently stands, that CERB has a four month period on it that uh, employees can draw down on for four months. We do not yet know if that will be extended, um, but that's available. Uh, the government has said when the CERB, if someone has been drawing down on the CERB for four months and, uh, and, and that is elapsed and they still are off, then they, the employment insurance uh, could also be there for them. So, um, you know, you can only do what you can do, uh, but those are some of the ideas and things that I've seen. Uh, thanks, Brad. The last question that's in our chat, and uh, we have about four minutes left, um, says, I own a hair salon and we're not able to keep the two meter social distancing requirement, and presumably you're not open yet either, um, when serving a guest. Do both parties need to wear a mask when there is no face-to-face -face contact? Um, I'll take the Saskatchewan actually just opened up hairdressing salons uh, and hairstylists today. Uh, or maybe it's Tuesday. Anyway, their, their guidance is that you should wear a, a shield that goes around and you should go as far as the ears and down below the chin. Um, and you should wear a non-surgical mask. Um, uh, and the client should also wear a mask. So that's what Saskatchewan is recommending. And we haven't seen any specific recommendations on that here in New Brunswick. One of the things, uh, the questions that has been raised by many of our members is that the, um, the guidelines that have been provided by the provincial government, uh, by WorkSafe, um, uh, by public safety and public health have been uh, not specific, but basically saying, here's the goal of what you need to accomplish and you figure out how you want to accomplish that yourself. And I do believe it is the first time in history that businesses been, have been asking for more uh, guidance or red tape guidelines. Um, but in this instance, it would be, um, that's a very good question that, that I know will be asked probably here in the next week or so here in New Brunswick. So when we do the second part of this uh, on Friday, we're doing a whole section on, first, on masks and personal protective equipment. But if there's two people that are within uh, uh, six meters of one another and, and, and it's unavoidable, they both have to wear, it's mandatory in New Brunswick under the uh, guidelines uh, that they wear a mask. But we're, okay. we're going to spend a lot of time in this area on Friday. Look, um, there's no other questions that have come in. Uh, we're about three minutes to our end time. Um, and I don't see any hands raised in the participant list at this time. So I am going to um, close the event. I want to say a particular thank you to our panelists. This has been so uh, informative, so helpful, and provided each and every one of us um, with some good information. Um, I did just see one hand go up. Roger Duvall, do we want to have a very quick question and a very quick answer and then we'll close it off? Yeah, just a very quick one. Uh, the, the importance of uh, building up your immune system. So having a strong immune system uh, in helping uh, towards prevention, uh, to what extent should that be promoted amongst the employees and just the general population? Matthew. Uh, certainly having a, a good immune system will help prevent all disease
diseases or all infectious diseases, the challenge is how best to do that. Um, and there aren't any proven medications to increase uh, immunity. Some people talk about taking high doses of zinc, magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D. Um, and it's not clear that there is one that is effective. But just because there isn't proof doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We, we just don't have the evidence. Um, reduce, reducing stress, easier said than done, is thought to uh, improve immune response. And being generally healthy, being a non-smoker, not obesity is one of the risk factors with a BMI greater than 40. So morbidly obese is a risk factor. So being in good shape, regular physical exercise, don't smoke, eat a well-rounded diet, keep your stress level easier said than done at a at a as low as possible would re go for walks you know uh spend time with your family work life balance all of those things are helpful no question look thanks again to all of our panelists to dr bernstein thank you so much uh david brad glenn and i want to say a special thank you also again to the atlantic provinces chamber of commerce uh, for co-sponsoring this event with us and uh, indeed a special thank you to all of you who have attended today um, and looking forward to uh, part two on Friday. Um, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you again on Friday morning for part two. Thank you.